Well, thank you, Minister. And uh, again, I think uh, the opportunity that we can explore some of the issues in the whole health portfolio and aged care uh, is something that I think uh, many people in the audience would love to do. So here's the opportunity. Questions, as has been the case for the last day and a half, microphones, roving microphones in the hands of two outstanding CETA staff uh, are available. Who has the first question? Don't be afraid. Michael Broadhead from Folk. Thank you very much, Minister Lay. The um, uh, previous session talking about um, social services and innovation and so on, there was a lot of talk in there about making the space for innovation. Could you talk us through a little bit about the process that led to healthcare homes, so how that came from um, inception to an idea and now into trial and rollout? Thank you. Uh, yes, when I became health minister, I asked what the two key for three key reforms in healthcare. One was the MBS review, which was a no-brainer given, as I said, 30 years since the items were looked at. And that relates very much to the specialist professions, not entirely, but very much to them. Um, so the logical question was, what's the key thing in primary care? Um, you know, how do we respond to the needs of both providers and also the needs of consumers in a marketplace, if I can use that term loosely, um, where the signals are, you know, not straightforward. In other words, if you're a consumer of healthcare, you don't necessarily know whether the healthcare you've received is good or bad. You often talk to people, I've so-and-so did my operation, fantastic, wouldn't, wouldn't go to anyone else. Doctors will tell you privately their out-of-pocket is $10,000, they're no different from the person, you know, down the road in a different system, but you can't explain that to the consumer. So the challenge for healthcare homes is saying, well, how do we meet the needs of the consumer while meeting the real needs of the, um, well, it's not so much the needs of the medical profession, but the, the ability for them to provide the best possible healthcare, which they want to do in primary care. They are absolutely committed to doing. So the healthcare home model was created originally by the Royal College of General Practitioners. It's got various iterations around the world. Um, creating the space for innovation meant co-design, a bit of a trendy word, consultation and co-design. That's actually, I think, where the strength of the model is. So for, a, you know, for nearly a year, we brought uh, Dr. Steve Hamilton to the table with consumers, with allied health, with GPs, with everyone, and said, how would you design this? And what I said was, don't focus on the dollars because we want the model and the dollars will follow. A, you know, that's almost a separate discussion. So by not being too prescriptive early on, by bringing the right people to the table, I believe we got in the report, which is on my department's website, the best possible model for healthcare homes. And everyone gets hung up on the dollars. Um, but I simply say this, if you, uh, this is not the NHS, this is a level of capitation in payments. So it's bundled payments for some of your patients, not all of them, and you can still have Medicare for them occasionally and for the rest of your patients. So it's not the NHS saying, okay, doctors, this is what we're gonna pay you, suck it up. It's quite different. And by the way, as I say to doctors, you don't have to do it. So I'm, we're bringing together a model that's not compulsory, um, that has everything doctors want, and you know, will be a bit of an argy bargy about the dollars. But, but, but I'm certainly not as health minister going to walk away from this. So I think the doctors can be confident we'll get somewhere where they're happy. Thank you. Hello, Sue, Sue Ash from Chartered Accountants. Minister, I'd like to ask you specifically about um, mental health and with instances um, both critical and situational in terms of mental health, how is your portfolio, your department responding to perhaps what is looking like a, an upward trend? Mm. Um, thank you for the question and I um, stopped my remarks before I got to two key areas of reform which are mental health and private health. So I'm glad you've asked me that question. We implemented the recommendations of our National Mental Health Commission late last year. Um, again, um, not government or bureaucrats saying what the mental health system should look like, but implementing the report that the, the um, recommendations of experts. The key reforms that we have introduced that are starting to roll out now are delivering mental health services through the primary health networks, not one size fits all from Canberra. So the primary health networks in mental health, I think probably get about $371 million. It's a lot of money, which means they can properly resource what they need in their communities. Communities in outback Australia are going to be quite different from those in Metro Sydney or Melbourne. 
Now, the, their, their needs are informed by clinical committees and by consumers at the ground level. So the other, um, what, what we had in the Medicare funding of mental health was very much one size fits all. So you could get um, an appointment with, a, a, a number of appointments with a psychologist. This is an, a clinical psychologist through Medicare. So if you presented with this issue to your GP, and GPs will say to me, somebody walks in the door with this black box saying anxiety, I don't want to open it because I, I, I don't know what to do. So they would tend to refer to these clinical psychologists because there was a model under Medicare, but you might not need a clinical psychologist. That's quite a medium intensity intervention. You might just need something lower intensity, something with generalist counselling, something with coaching, or you might need specialist integrated care. So we've said our money is just going to stretch across the spectrum, stepped care model, depending on where you are. The other thing we're doing that's, that's vital in our um, coordination with the states through the primary health networks because they overlap state health boundaries is fix the disjointedness between being discharged from an acute mental health facility often into a vacuum. Uh, how many times have we heard the tragedy of someone who's in an acute facility perhaps because of a suicide attempt and then gets discharged and there's nothing because they're back into a into a system that's actually funded by a different level of government, or the two don't coordinate well between governments or inside governments. So we're going to fix that transition, and the states are working with me on that. And um, suicide prevention, given some awful statistics I think you referred to, um, we've announced during the campaign 12 suicide prevention trial sites. One is in Townsville to reflect the circumstances of veterans. The other one is in the Kimberley where I'm going at the end of this week to make sure we do the right thing. Um, obviously if you have mental health, mental unwellness, you are more likely to try to commit suicide. But suicide strikes across the spectrum of people who are quite well and we, actually, we need to know more. Um, we don't really know what we don't know, so there's a lot of research that needs to happen, so we're bringing that together in a new initiative. And because of the Prime Minister's personal passion for mental health, we've uh, been able to secure an additional $192 million during the campaign for special interventions into mental health, particularly in the severe youth end of the spectrum, and particularly around innovation. There's lots going on. Thank you. Uh, Monica Ryan, just a question in the um, um, aged care part of your portfolio. How do you see the mental health, the My Aged Care Gateway, um, providing information and education to consumers about available aged care services so that we can look to keep aged people in their homes longer? I do want My Aged Care to be more than it is at the moment, and we've invested another $100 million in the last budget to build it up. It had a bit of a shaky start and that was, you know, as, as a lot of these gateway systems, digital gateway systems do, but we've got, and that manifested itself in people being cranky, uh, too long a call waiting times, not happy with the advice they get, of course. So lots has happened to improve that. We've, we've I think it answered, a, referred about 400,000 people last year and took about twice as many calls. But I think a lot of this is getting ahead of the, uh, of the time when you need aged care, usually for a relative and it's a bit of a crisis. And so um, I'm embarking on more of an information campaign to inform people about what their entitlements are, what they can access, how it works, start thinking about it now, um, be prepared and use my aged care very much as an information portal. So I look forward to it becoming you know, bigger and better than it is now. I have time for one final question from, of course, National Chairman Paul McClintock. <clears throat> there are some privileges of rank, perhaps, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, Minister, we had three uh, state treasurers uh, at lunch yesterday, and they all said that uh, they were open to things like tax reform, but that it would have to be part of a general review of the Federation and the roles that the states and the Commonwealth were mm. playing in a number of key areas. Uh, you have made already a reference to some of the complexities around that. Um, it seems to me that a lot of what you're doing, it more and more asserts, I think quite rightly, that the Commonwealth Government does have a responsibility you write into primary health care, which you've always been, of course, but but some of those interventions are deeply into those areas. They are related to aged care. Would you, your guess be that once we finish that review of the Federation, 
that health would be clearly seen as a Commonwealth Government responsibility and the states would be largely in the role of operating hospitals under a Commonwealth system. That's one model for reform of the Federation, Paul, but it's probably not one I would support and I think it's also quite a challenge. Now, Kevin Rudd um, was very uh, determined to bring the hospitals under federal control by funding more than 50% of their operating cost. Um, that was problematic. The funder of the public hospital should be the, you know, the, 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 the mistakes or the inefficiencies inside that system need very much to belong to the funder of it. So that's, I think, part of a challenge generally in the Federation where the level of government that provides the money doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily able to follow through and make sure that it's spent in the areas that attached to their priorities. I think we've landed in a reasonably good place. The Prime Minister negotiated a $2.9 billion deal with states, which you may notice has kept them very quiet on hospital funding for three years while we move to a longer term, more sustainable model, which will probably have us funding about 45% of the cost of running public hospitals and the states funding 55% and us sticking with activity-based funding. Activity-based funding, um, which started in Victoria, I think under Jeff Kennett, was certainly picked up a lot under the Rudd government, is, is, is actually a very useful reform. Because under activity-based funding, the actual growth in cost, not, not attributable to the population growing, or the, is, 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 is a, a under 2%. So we actually have constrained the growth in funding inside our public hospital systems very well with activity-based funding. And we're, we're partners in it. So the states can't say we want to draw on more money because for every 45 cents we put in, they put in 55 cents. So look, it is complicated and um, uh, there are pluses and minuses in the sort of the, the takeover by the Commonwealth or pushing the entire health system back to the states, which would include primary care, which doesn't really make sense. But I think our current, and, and we're at a time now where our state uh, health ministers are using our primary health networks, which link with their hospital system, to start to get the coordination of care between going in and going out of hospitals. So we've structured our agreement saying less avoidable hospital admissions. In other words, if you're not looked after properly, you turn back up in emergency. Um, no payments when you you know, when safety and quality is not high. And the states are buying into that. So we're actually in a very good reform space without creating a whole new model. Minister, thank you so much for your responses to the questions from, uh, from delegates uh, this afternoon. Can I, uh, on their behalf, thank you most sincerely for making time available. Uh, the health portfolio at the national level, I think, is probably one of the most challenging. And uh, we wish you every success as you uh, seek to define uh, the Commonwealth's role, uh, working with your state colleagues, but importantly, as I think uh, we, we discussed in the last session here, ensuring that uh, it's in fact the consumers that ultimately will benefit. And uh, I think your comment that Commonwealth dollars should be used uh, for frontline services and a couple of the other comments that you made uh, clearly fit with the mood, I think, of uh, the delegates here today. So again, thank you for your thank you. support of CEDA and please thank the Minister.